Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're executive directors of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. We invite you to join us in our vital work or ask for a free copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today, at ffrf.org. Org. And we're so very pleased to have as our guest today Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, who has represented the District of Columbia for 15 terms and is a member of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, which promotes public policy based on reason, science, and moral values, and protects the secular character of our government. Eleanor Holmes Norton graduated from Yale Law School in 1964. She argued and won her first case before the Supreme Court just four years later in 1968. She is a tenured professor of law at Georgetown University. She's been a lifelong advocate for universal and civil rights. She helped organize the 1963 March on Washington and she worked with John Lewis when both were young members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. She worked with Medgar Evers, and she bore witness to Fannie Lou Hamer's mistreatment. She was part of the Mississippi Freedom Summer and has championed voting rights and self-government for the District of Columbia. Her feminist credentials include being appointed by President Jimmy Carter to be the first woman to chair the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, where she crafted the first sexual harassment regulations. She convened the first hearings in the nation on discrimination against women as New York City Commissioner on Human Rights. Representative Norton successfully represented 60 female employees who sued over Newsweek's policy allowing only men to be reporters. And she's been an early and now lifelong champion of reproductive rights. And it's truly an honor to meet you, even if it's only remotely, Representative Norton. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you as well. Well, thank you. And I have to say, I first saw you on stage uh, before abortion was legal at a national abortion conference. And I was thrilled as a teenager to see a real woman attorney, a, a young crusading legal eagle who was working to overturn laws criminalizing abortion. And so it's a thrill to meet you now. And could we talk for a little bit about your very early reproductive rights advocacy and now so many years later still needing to work to protect abortion rights? Much of my defense uh, about abortion rights comes from uh, my work as a feminist, believing that women ought to have uh, full and equal rights with men, including rights uh, over their own bodies. But that work is deepened by representing the District of Columbia. We have just gotten a bill through the House of Representatives to make the district the 51st state of the United States. Yes. But until that time, the Congress can intervene into the affairs of the district. Its favorite, or one of its favorite ways to intervene is to uh, try to eliminate the district's laws, which are like the laws of, of many states that uh, would allow women uh, to have ab abortions. Uh, and so I'm having to fight that one perhaps more than any other uh, law that they have tried to overturn, and they've tried to overturn many here in the district. In, in the District of uh, Columbia, is abortion rights covered if somebody is on Medicaid? If I'm able to keep the Congress out of our affairs, and these bills are still going through this year, they have not, we have not finished in the House. Uh, yes, uh, we, we would we would cover uh, we would cover women for abortion as we cover for any other procedure. Well, I hope that will go through. So we are mourning the death of John Lewis, and you worked with John Lewis as a, a young person. Did you ever dream back in those early days that both of you would become members of Congress? I think I can say without fear 
that John would contradict me, that neither of us uh, envisioned being members of the House when we were both students in SNCC, as we called it, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, but perhaps uh, even less so for me, because uh, the district didn't, for, for most of its 219 years, the district didn't even have a representative in Congress. So I couldn't have dreamed about it. As a third generation Washingtonian, uh, I wanted to be a lawyer. That's something I knew I could be. But even though I'm living in the District of Columbia, I'm living in the nation's capital, going to the capital as a representative uh, was not something I could envision as a child. But you grow that vision, and I have become that person. So we just celebrated the centennial of the adoption of the 19th Amendment, the Women's Suffrage Amendment. Um, and you've put yourself on the line for voting rights for black Americans, and now you represent the District of Columbia, but you don't have a vote in Congress. I wondered if you could talk about that and some of those struggles. Uh, yes, that, that, that's a, a, a most important mark on the United States at the moment. Uh, when Democrats control the House, as we do now, I vote on some matters in the Committee of the Whole. But I do not have a vote on the House floor, a final vote on the House floor. Uh, but bear in mind, the people I represent are rank number one per capita in taxes paid to support the United States of America. So you can imagine uh, the uh, outrage we feel whenever we hear the notion of taxation without representation. Mm -hmm. How about number one in taxation with, without representation? Yes. Now, I should mention that the House has given me every other right that House members have. I'm chair of a subcommittee now. I can become chair of a full committee that's based on seniority. Uh, I go to the House floor. I'll be going to the House floor this very or next week when, when the House comes back um, uh, to speak like everyone else speaks. Uh, but that, when they call the final vote, even though sometimes that vote is about the District of Columbia, I cannot vote. That so, must be a bitter feeling. So what are some of the committees that you are on? Uh, I'm on uh, the House Oversight Committee, C C Committee on Oversight. That has oversight over all the laws. Uh, of the United States. We just had a hearing today on the census, for example. Uh, I'm also on uh, my next major committee is one that has many subcommittees. It's uh, Highways and Transit, uh, particularly important to my district. So um, we so much appreciate your being part of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why you are a supporter of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, and, and how does it mesh with your other priorities? Well, I wouldn't say the Free Thought Caucus is one of my priorities, but I certainly felt I should join uh, because I believe in the separation of, of church and state. Uh, and that is something that we've had to fight uh, in the Congress time and again as Republicans have tried to intrude religious matters into the life of the country. And in, in D.C., there's a particular, pro there has been a particular fight o over this um, so-called Religious Freedom Restoration Act and its effects on the District of Columbia and, and women and LGBTQ. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what's wrong with that Religious Freedom Restoration Act and how it's been interfering with rights. That's an act that allows um, some um, recognition of religious rights. Um, uh, so far, it's not been held unconstitutional. I'm not sure of where it stands uh, now, or whether there's litigation. It, it's kind of something that allows somebody who has a sincerely held religious belief to basically discriminate 
against someone else, or maybe the civil rights law doesn't apply to them because they're religious. And yes, in, in short, it does allow discrimination uh, on the base, basis of a religiously held belief. Now, I don't know where you find a basis for that in the Constitution. That's why I say I, I'm, I'm not sure of, of where that, where litigation is on that matter. It's certainly something that uh, is almost surely been or will be challenged. Yeah, it's, right now it's kind of winning, but um, we'll see. Well, and then let's talk about some very good news this summer where we saw the House vote to give statehood to D.C. Does, it does look like there's growing momentum, and this must be something that you've worked so hard for. Uh, we, well, it was a historic moment because yes. it's the first time in the in the history of the existence of this city. I say, as I said before, it's 219 years old that we have passed a bill to make the nation's capital the equivalent of other parts of our country with all the rights uh, that are guaranteed to to others. Uh, it was an overwhelming vote, uh, and I am very hopeful that we will proceed uh, or at least make real progress, because the polls show that Democrats could capture the Senate and that Joe Biden has a very good chance of becoming president, and he is a strong supporter of D.C. statehood. And we should hasten to say that um, FFRF and this, this uh, show are nonpartisan. We don't take a stand. but. Um, so what will the new flag look like with 51 stars? That's that would be a challenge, <laughs> won't it? <laughs> well, I have such a flag, I, I, on my website, uh, there's me holding up such a flag. But I tell you, when you, <laughs> when you add a 51st star, uh, and you already have 50, uh, you almost all, you almost always do so in a way that no one can tell the difference. Uh -huh. <laughs> Well, that will be a great time to add that, and, and I'd like to see Puerto Rico, too. <laughs> well, Puerto Rico is divided on whether yeah. they want to become the 51st state. Uh, they, they are split. The matter has never come for a vote. And unlike the District of Columbia, the Puerto, Puerto Rico, in part because of climate change, uh, is in very bad straits and cannot support itself. Uh, one of the things you've got to be able to do is to show that you are able to support yourself in order to become a state. So, so at the moment, we are further along than Puerto Rico. Well, they can't support themselves because American companies have pretty much stolen most of the value from that island. Uh, we have to take a break. Uh, and after the break, Representative Norton, we want to talk about some of the major blows to the Voting, voting Rights Act. So we'll be right back with Senator Eleanor Holmes Norton. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate just like our Founding Fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. I'm Doug Hinahara, and I'm an out-of-the-closet atheist. I consider myself fortunate in that I wasn't raised in an overly religious family, so I was allowed to think for myself. And around the time I was 17, as I was exploring these ideas of religion, I was told by a fundamentalist Christian that my grandmother, who had emigrated from Japan, was destined to eternal damnation because she was a Buddhist. And I couldn't accept that, and it kind of unraveled from there for me. So at this point in my life, I've been become very comfortable with the idea that I don't need religion uh, or belief in God to be a moral person and live an ethical life. 
I'm proud of the fact that I have two daughters who have grown up to be wonderful young women, and I'm proud to say also atheist. Thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. You can find more content by the Freedom From Religion Foundation at our website, ffrf.org. Follow FFRF on Facebook and you'll get notifications about all of our content, including whenever we go live on FFRF's Ask an Atheist. FFRF is also on YouTube, where all of our programs, including this show and our weekly news bites are available to watch anytime. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you on the web. Welcome back to Free Thought Matters. We're continuing our conversation with Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton. The very distinguished representative of the District of Columbia. And we've been talking about the, the lack of statehood in D.C., although we had that historic vote. To give it statehood in the House, we've been talking about the fact that as a representative of the District of Columbia, you don't have a vote on the floor. And But let's talk about voting rights in general. and. Uh, some of the problems that we have had with um, endangered voting rights? Well, we, we've had uh, huge problems with, with uh, suppression of votes during this administration. That's different from the Voting Rights Act, which mm -hmm. applies to the southern part of the United States. That needs to be renewed. There's more interest in it because of the interest in voting now and the kind of voter suppression we're seeing in various parts of the United States. Now, the Voting Rights Act, however, applies to parts of the United States which generally, which have a history, rather, of denying the vote uh, to African Americans. It needs to be updated. It has been. Uh, getting it, I believe that with all of the concern and interest in voting now, that that act, the renewal of the Voting Rights Act, uh, has been given a boost. Well, I hope so. And, and that does lead to the, the need to get the vote out. Um, could, you, could you talk a little bit about what's at stake? There are going to be tremendous uh, issues. The president is trying to create issues that aren't even there. But there would be tre tremendous issues anyway by use of mail-in voting and absentee voting. I am encouraging all of my constituents to vote early in person so that they do not get hung up in this mess. Uh, we've always had successful uh, mail-in voting, uh, but I, 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 we've always had mail-in voting, and it's always been successful, is how I should put that. And I think it will be successful this year. What we haven't had is um, huge uh, numbers, many members of the public deciding uh, to vote uh, by mail. Um, they're perfectly capable of doing it. The rules are different state to state. Mm -hmm. uh, ca uh, handling the volume is going to be uh, possible. Uh, but there will be, I predict, great confusion uh, on November 3rd uh, because the rules are different state to state. And there's no way in the world we can have a final vote. Uh, by November the 4th, even. So it could take days, even weeks, to mm -hmm. learn who won what and where. So, so having you... a voting plan is very important, and mm -hmm. I think your advice to vote early in person is excellent advice, especially uh, in this time of COVID, there should be fewer lines then. That's what I found when I went to vote in the primary. I, there was hardly anyone there, and I didn't even vote early. I, I voted close to the end, uh, and I found and vowed then to make sure my constituents knew that that is the leisurely way to vote. So speaking of COVID and science and science deniers, 
you are a member of, you're a member of a number of caucuses, the Congressional Progressive Caucus, the Congressional Black Caucus, and the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, which promotes reason and science. Do you think our country is losing track of our, the importance of science? I, I think that with the uh, coming of this coronavirus, perhaps we are learning how important science really is. Uh, that's certainly number one. Number two, uh, for those of us in the Congress who, for, for whom science means anything, climate change sure, surely should tell us everything we need to know about science. When you see the possible end of life as we know it, you yeah. understand how important science is and how foolish it is that we have leadership that is not only doing nothing about climate change, uh, but uh, passing regulations that make climate issues worse. Yes, yes. Well, now I do want to talk about some of your crowning achievements for the District of Columbia. And the, one of the achievements I hadn't known about until I researched it, which I am so impressed about, are some of the major benefits for high school graduates in the District of Columbia. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a unique benefit I was able to get for the district because uniquely we do not have a state university system. The district is in many ways like a state, but in many other ways, it is simply unique. So that you have small states, states whose population may be even smaller than ours, but they will have many state university options. We have only one state university, the University of the District of Columbia. It's an open admissions university, but we are a very diverse and very educated uh, district so that our people would want access to a, a complete university system. And the only way to get that, uh, I found, was to allow uh, our residents to, uh, to apply to any state university system in the United States and be subsidized uh, by in this case, the Congress, up to $10,000 uh, per year. It turns out that most state universities don't cost much more than that. Uh, and uh, if they do, then getting that $10,000 will take you a long way uh, toward what the coverage would be at a place like Berkeley, for example, at the University of California. Well, that is quite an achievement for the young people of your district, and I'm very admiring of it. And there's something else that also uh, I admire a great deal, which is that uh, finally there is a statue representing the District of Columbia in the U.S. Capitol, where there's statues to each state, but there wasn't one for D.C. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about who is honored there and how that, ha how that came to be. Is, isn't there one of Frederick Douglass now? We have one statue representing the District of Columbia. We want to. I see. Uh, and and I, yes, I think it is Frederick Douglass. That's right. That's right. Every state gets two statues, but the District of Columbia doesn't. Well, um, so I was able to get us uh, uh, Frederick Douglass in yes. there. And the uh, I am almost certain gonna, certainly going to get us Pierre Lafont, which is, which is mm. the second statue that the district uh, had ordered and is waiting to go in. Wow. Well, that's an accomplishment. That's a hard thing to do in Congress. And of All course, of this moves us toward being treated at the same as, as, the, as, as the states. Right. And of course, Frederick Douglass lived in D.C., such an important figure. Yes, he, uh, Frederick Douglass was a D.C. resident and really was the first leader to speak out for equal rights for D.C. residents to vote here and in the Congress. And such an early advocate of women's right to vote, too. 
Indeed, he was prescient in, in many ways. Well, he was at the 1848 Women's Conference, what's it called? Yeah, Women's, Women's Seneca Falls Convention. Seneca Falls Convention, that's Seneca right. Falls, yes. Uh. So as a lifelong activist, Representative Norton, how do you stay optimistic? Oh, I find it easy to stay optimistic. Remember, I was born and raised in a city where I had to go to segregated schools. That's no longer the case. I was born and raised in a city that didn't have any rights whatsoever, uh, not even the right to vote locally. I was born and raised in a city that had no rights uh, to have a member of Congress. And here I sit as a member of the House of Representatives. So I, I, if you believe in change, then of course you must be optimistic. I believe in change because I have seen change happen and because I have helped make change happen in my own city. All of that makes me, into, it makes me an eternal optimist. <laughs> Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton, thank you for everything you've done for, for universal rights and women's rights and civil rights. We're really grateful that you could join us today. It's, a ple it's, it's been a pleasure to speak with you. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.